to talk about some rather amazing things that I discovered. This is Tony. I hope you're all doing well. I showed this video over my other channel about a SkyTrain from 1902, as you can see here. Rather smooth. Seems like pretty high technology for that time frame. You can see there I have nice bridges, beautiful architecture. Not what you would expect back in the 1900s. A SkyTrain? Really? How about Skype? Skype back in 1928, 1935. This here is 1928. This is 1935. I can show you that. Um, let's see, where is it at? Here we go. Skype back in 1935. That's kind of weird. It's like almost 100 years ago. They're pretty much doing what we do for a living now. You know, if you work from your home, you, you're pretty much using something like that. <laughs> they just don't have a computer. They got Skype, though. I guess they didn't have computers back then. That's, that's something different, right? But actually, we had more advanced technology than even what we saw 100 years ago, probably two, 300 years ago. I'm going to show you a little bit of that as well. You can see here the post office using scooters back 100 years ago to mail. And like I said, this SkyTrain was from 120 years ago. This wasn't 100. This was 120 years ago. Notice the buildings look a lot better than ours. We, we, don't, we got Walmart and Slurpees now, folks. They got... Beautiful architecture. We got pretty much square boxes we live in, right? I mean, literally. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what it is with a little roof on it, you know. Uh, I, like I said, I'm going to be getting into a lot of interesting stuff. They had buses back then. They even had, I mean, this wasn't 100 years ago, but they actually had some pretty advanced uh, flying contraptions. I would, when I watch this video, it looks just as good as some of the ones they make today. That's all the that's the entire thing right there, by the way. There's no propeller. It's using a jet engine, folks. This was like 80 years ago. They're using a jet engine on this. And it looks better than the ones they make today. I mean, it actually flies better. It goes 60 miles an hour. Like, really? They actually made it better back then. And this actually was... Uh, they actually picked helicopters over this, by the way. This was the one main thing competing with helicopters back in the early days, like the 50s and stuff. Uh, they decided on helicopters and actually abandoned that technology that I just showed you, which is kind of curious, as you can imagine. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be getting into a lot of stuff. Here you can see here, 1928, 1935, just like I said. Um, you could literally Skype someone in another city, another state, using... A Skype, uh, a, a phone, a TV, sitting at a chair, just like you can do today. And there's actually other technology that makes you really wonder. Let me show you this. This is what really makes me wonder. They had the Crystal Palace that was in Britain, which we can't, we could, they couldn't maintain it. After they got automatic manufacturing, by the way, my background's mechanical engineering. I studied all this in college, the history of technology, things in this realm. Automated, automated manufacturing was something that came in during the industrial age. Henry Ford was one of the main people to first pioneer this. But what's interesting is even after they had automated manufacturing, they had automatic glass made, making. They had machines to make glass they couldn't maintain the Crystal Palace in Britain. They couldn't maintain this building either, the manufacturing building in Chicago. This building, look at this building. Look at this machinery. They're, they're, they're supposed to be showing off their advanced machinery from the industrial age. And look at this building itself. The building itself is something they couldn't even build with this machinery. They couldn't even maintain these buildings. They couldn't maintain the glass structures above it, even after they got automatic. So just imagine, we're told that they didn't have, okay, before automatic glass making, before automated manufacturing, they had horse and buggy and by hand did things, right? So where did this building come from? How did they build this building with horse and buggy and by hand? I'm, I'm scratching my head here, folks. This technology inside this building isn't even re remotely good enough to manufacture this. I think I have a right to say that. I'm a mechanical, mechanical engineer. I even studied architectural design. 
I think I might know a few things. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you, it doesn't look, it doesn't make sense. And like I, I mentioned before, you also have the population growth, which is very strange. Uh, I'm not showing this best on the screen, but this is basically 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900. And then we had an explosion of population around 1930 or 40 until now. Essentially, they're telling us that there was no population growth for thousands of years. Does that even make any sense? I, I don't really think so. It doesn't make tons. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You have these uh, water fountains, extremely elaborate water fountains, Versailles, France, that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yet for some reason, in this extremely large building in the background, there's no plumbing. There's no toilets. How is it they were able to move this water and make these magnificent, mag magnificent water fountains, as you can see here, that even shoot up at different times? This is old technology. This is not some new stuff they created. Hundreds and hundreds of years old. For some reason, they couldn't put plumbing in the, in the, in the, in the building itself. I don't believe that. So why didn't they put plumbing? Why didn't they put toilets in these castles? Probably because the people using them didn't need the toilet. Why would that be the case? Well, maybe because they were not exactly from here. They weren't you and I. They were a little bit different than you and I. And what do I mean by that? And you're like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> well, maybe it's because we don't understand our history very well. And I'm going to get into that. If you watch my other video, you might know already what I'm getting at. But we'll be getting into that actually in a lot more in this video. As we go along, uh, first though, I've got to mention fruit, food supply, 25 year shelf life. Link is in the description. Three months worth for $5.97. You already spend this much for one month worth of food at Kroger. And it don't have no 25 year shelf life. You're going to definitely want to get this, folks. This is the same price they had four years ago. Matter of fact, it's even cheaper than it was like three years ago. Three years ago, they were like trying to sell this for $800. They're selling it for, they're selling it for cheaper than three years ago. Unlike every other company out there. These guys are the ones you want to buy from these guys. Link is in the description if you haven't already bought that. There's also other packages. You can even get, I think there's like a $49 package even for like one week worth. You got $127 for two weeks worth. Link is in the description. Of course, also this book here, The Lost Ways, How Your Great Great Grandfather Lived Without Electricity. Back in the old days, in, the, in you know, 1900s, early 1900s, 1800s, back in the, uh, the rural areas. But actually, what's interesting is I think maybe two, three, four hundred years ago, it might not really have been the case in some cases with regards to the rural areas. They might have also had electricity back then. I'll get into that a little bit in this video. But I do think about 100, 150 years ago, you'd be hard-pressed to find any electricity out in the rural areas, and they were able to live without it. You might want to get this book just in case because you might have uh, an, uh, something like that happen to you considering all the stuff that's been going on around us at WAR that seems to never end. It could turn into something much larger. Who knows? It could be... Whatever reason, you can't afford electricity anymore. That was an issue for a while, particularly in Europe, about half a year ago. Um, link is in the description. Hundreds of pages illustrated how to do things around the house, recipes, all manner of stuff, uh, how to build a cellar, et cetera, et cetera. Link is in the description for that. Um, same price it's been four years ago as well. $37 with shipping. Also, if you want to support us on Noah VR, the game we're designing, you can actually get involved and be able to make money in the process. $400 put in and you can get a share of profits. You can get the 400 plus more back when we release the game, folks. Leak is in the description. If we're even halfway uh, successful with this, you're going to make multifold over the $400, folks. Leak is in the description. Again, we have one of the top programmers in the world. We're already halfway done with the game. We've been working on it for two years. I've been paying the guy the entire time to work on this for me. One of the top level VR programmers in the world. On top of that, we're looking to hire, and we already, uh, thanks to a lot of you, we've already gotten a lot of money in already. And we were able to already speed up the process. We were already able to buy some software that really helped out 
to speed up the process and cut out a lot of man hours. We're also interviewing people right now. We're trying to, we have a number of guys that we want to bring on board. We don't have enough money to bring uh, all the ones we want to bring on board yet. But if we do raise some more money, we will be able to bring on some guys that worked on Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, Transformers on the team. They actually ask our programmer for advice on how to do VR. We're also going to be making a standard version. We're using the VR to get our foot in the door with PlayStation and Xbox. After that, then we'll have the standard version as well, which will probably sell more copies even on top of it. And we're going to be releasing it on Steam as well. And, I mean, if we're even halfway successful, it could be at $200 million. There's one game that made $200 million in one year. It started out in a very similar manner, very grassroots. But, at any rate, check that out. Link is in the description. Of course, my website also, a link is in the description. If you're looking for more videos like this one here, check it out, grvideos.com. Link is in the description for that. Let's get back to the video. So, so what was I talking about? I'm trying to remember what I was in. Okay, so I was getting into... I was getting into, oh yeah, the water fountains. That's what I was talking about. So these water fountains are very interesting and they, and they really tell you a story. I feel like this architecture in the past tells a story that they don't tell us in the classroom. Because honestly, at looking at this from, from an architectural standpoint, from a mechanical engineering standpoint, this does not make any sense. How is it we have buildings back hundreds of years ago that defy explanation. Here we have an island in Normandy, France, which is essentially has no roads to it. They, they've, they've, they've put roads to it now, but it didn't have roads to it at one time. They have a, a, a tide that comes in and it actually fills up the area. This absolutely stunning uh, cathedral, okay? This is Mont, Mont St. Michael unbelievable architecture it makes literally no sense what's going on here why is there this you know this is like the disney world logo i mean it, it literally is this is probably where they got their idea from was from this island from mount st michael um you look at the architecture inside that thing it's just unbelievable and i didn't have it open but i could show you some it's just really amazing but they they tell us the story behind it doesn't even make sense they claim that St. Michael, the angel, told him to build it in, in his honor, which makes no sense. Why would an angel tell you to honor him? That sounds like a fallen type of angel, not an actual normal angel. Michael, the archangel, would have not said something like that, but they claim this is what he said. It's very obvious he wouldn't have said something like that if you understand how, how the teaching goes. But let me see if I can get inside the, inside the building or inside. Um, let's try this. Inside. There we go. As you can see here, supposedly they built this with horse and buggy. They somehow transplanted all this stone structure and built this on a, a, a little mountain in the ocean. So how did they transfer all this stuff over there? How did they build this with horse and buggy? Tell me that. I want to know the answer to that one, folks. <laughs> okay? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, look at this. That's the courtyard right there. And we don't build anything like this, even if it's in an area easy to get to. We don't build anything like this today. So my whole point is, is that you can see that something different was happening a couple hundred, a few hundred years ago. They had buildings that we couldn't even maintain that ended up uh, going into obscurity and essentially being uh, taken down, like the, the Crystal Palace in, in Britain or the manufacturer's building in Chicago, which, of course, they used... In the uh, uh, the Chicago World Fair in 1893, but they they claim they built it in 1893, and I have a hard time believing that because it housed 300,000 people. Where is that at? I got I got a picture of that around here somewhere, where it shows half the building filled with people. Yeah, here we go. I've shown this as an icon before. I'm trying to think of the best way I could show this. Here we go. This is only half the building here. You're looking actually from the halfway point to one side. They supposedly built this with horse and buggy. I don't know about you, but that that just seems extremely unbelievable. I don't I don't believe they built this with horse and buggy. I don't even think we could build this today. We don't even have a building that can house 300,000 people today. We have no building that can house this many people. So how did they build it back then if we can't even build it today? We don't even have any buildings. I think the biggest one we have is 180,000 housed. 
That's like the biggest. We don't have no 300,000. Who built this? <laughs> Why couldn't they maintain it? Doesn't even make sense. But at any rate, so we're going to get into how these waterfall water fountains couldn't didn't had plumbing in this elaborate plumbing, but the, the buildings themselves didn't have restrooms. It's because they didn't need them. Why wouldn't they not need them? Because it, because maybe we're living in a time that you don't understand. Okay. Let me explain this out. Um, and I did it a little bit on the other video. I've talked about this guy before. The, the fact that no one knows these things is the problem. If in reality, if we were living in a in a standard, of course, world where people could communicate freely and do whatever they wanted, these would all be known. These would be all well known. The fact that there is a pope named six six and another six. This literally in Latin means that this term here is the the number six. Six this is Latin for six, three times. It says to watch out for this number in Revelation. No one knows this guy existed for some reason. But what's interesting about it is he was friends with St. Augustine. St. Augustine's like one of the most famous people in the church. How is it no one knows this guy existed? He was friends with St. Augustine. Are you kidding me? No one knows this guy existed. And this is not the only person. There's like a ton of these type of things. The, and what really made me realize that there's something going on here is the fact that I found a number of things that no one knows that everyone should know. Everyone should know that guy existed. I never learned about that growing up. I, I, I used to read tons of books when I first became a believer. Tons. I read like about Pope history back then. I remember reading about all the popes. I never heard of this guy. Even when I read about all the popes, they never talked about this guy. Not even once. Then, of course, there's a historical event that happened in AD 66 that no one knows about. You would I, I used to read tons of reference books. I literally had this thick book like this. I it, You're not supposed to read it. I was like obsessed with reading stuff. It's called the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. It's not a book you read. You don't read this book, okay? It's like a reference book. And I was reading it. That's how I was. I was reading like thick books. You're not supposed to read, okay? As you can see, this is only a fraction of the books. I actually sold a ton of books. I used to have a lot more, and I sold a bunch of them. And then I kind of regret it now, but I actually had more than that. I probably had about double that. But, um, you know, I used to read a ton of books, and I never heard of any of these things. No one ever talked. No one talks about these. Why does no one talk about this? Here you have a historical thing that happened, an historical event confirmed by three professional historians and no one knows about it, except for people that follow my channel, okay? The son, of course, of man, literally seen in the clouds in AD 66, confirmed by secular historians. Secular, secular historians. Secular. Tacitus is a secular historian. Roman historians. They don't believe in any of this stuff. Don't care about any of this stuff saying they saw chariots in the clouds. Not them. Thousands and thousands of... Everybody saw it. They couldn't deny the fact that everyone saw the exact same thing in the clouds. They couldn't explain it away. It was so many people that knew about it and so many people saw it that they had to historically write it down because it was in a historical event that everyone confirms. You see what I'm getting at? Happened in AD 66. No one knows about it. Why? Why don't you know about it? Is it because we maybe live in a time of deception? Could the devil be the one behind this? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to show you a little bit more. We don't take Jesus' words literal enough sometimes. Jesus says something and we just like, what? He says to these leaders, there's like leaders in his time. He says, you will see me in the clouds. And then we read it and we think, oh, he's talking to us 2,000 years later. He literally said it to leaders in his time frame, saying, you, 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 the guy in front of me, will see me in the clouds. He didn't say 2,000 years from now you'll see me in the clouds. He said, you, the guy standing in front of me, will see me in the clouds, right? Probably, probably have to be near his time frame <laughs> for it to happen, right? How about 8066? Does that sound close enough? That's pretty close. I'm sure plenty of those guys were still around in 8066. 
He was born in around zero AD. He'd only be like 60 years old, right? Not that old. I mean, well, I mean, that is pretty old for that time frame, but I'm sure a few of them were still around. It says right here, he said it to Caiaphas, you will see me in the clouds. You will see me in the clouds. And guess what? He did. He saw him in the clouds. Historically referenced by Flavius Josephus, Tacitus, he said to his own followers, you will see me come for you. He said that one of them will still be alive. I think it was John. Yeah, it was John. Uh, I think I have that. Where did I put it? Is it this one? No. No, no, no. Okay, never mind. I think I have it. I think it's actually on this document here I'm looking at. I'm sure it's around here somewhere. Because uh, I read it earlier on the other video. Some of you will not. Yeah, okay, here. I got it. Oh, come on. Let me look it up this way. I can find it. There we go. Where are you at? Some standing here will not taste this. Where did he say that, folks? You would assume it would just pull up the verse. Apparently not. Where does it say it at? <laughs> okay, Matthew 16, 28. There we go. Truly, I tell you, someone who are standing here will not taste death before you'll see me coming in my kingdom. Huh, that's interesting. And of course, there was a movie, Indiana Jones, that had John sitting in some secret room somewhere. Indiana Jones comes up to him and like, who are you? Oh, I'm John. I've been waiting here for 2,000 years. Why? Oh, because it says that I won't taste, you know, death before he comes back. So it's funny, man. It's like a movie, Indiana Jones, right? With uh, Harrison Ford. Yeah. So that's not what happened. He didn't have to wait 2,000 years for him to come back. He came back already in AD 66. Just no one knows about it, of course. Really kind of interesting why no one knows about it. Could it be because we're in that short time when Lucifer gets out of the pit? He has but a short time. It's only been 530, 530 years since the time he got out, according to my calculations based on what I've researched. When did he get out? At the end of the medieval times, he got out. At the time of Joan of Arc is when he got out. So actually, this might sound, you know, a little bit of this to most people that are believers, but he already came back twice. Yeah, 80, 66, and 450. And we're waiting for the final one. Come back a third time. This is the final, final one. You got the Gog and May, you know, Gog thing going on soon here. That's a W-A-R. That's the final thing that happens, which happens to be a world you know, W-A-R, which happens to align with exactly the group right now that's in a W-A-R, the Ruslans. They're supposed to be behind it. They're, that's the next thing. That's supposed to be the next thing that happens. And then that's the final, final, of course, end. And at that point, then it's all over. It's all over at that point. So did he come back in 450 as well? Well, it's interesting. I covered this over my other video. I, I don't want to try to repeat too much stuff, but what's interesting about this, Pope Sixtus III was at the time of 440 AD. 440 AD is the fall of the Roman Empire. It's right in the middle of it. You had 430 to 470 something was when the fall of the Roman Empire. It happened in three separate steps. Uh, there's three sections of the Roman Empire that fell to Germanic tribes. And it's discussed on this article here. And it actually fits perfectly what Revelation says. It says there'll be a horn. Okay, let me show you this. Uh, where is it at? Yeah, here we are. While I was considering the horn, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them. The th three of the first horns were uprooted before it, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Daniel 7, 8. Who is this little horn? It's called the Pope. Pope Sixtus III. That's his name. 
It says to watch out for this number, 666 six, and another 6 in Revelation. You have here the little horn uproots three horns. Who are the three horns? I'll show you who the three horns are. According to this, the Gothic king Alaric was one of them. So you had the Visigoths, the Vandals, and Odysseus, Odes Germanic people. These are Germanic tribes that conquered Rome. The Visigoths, the Vandals, and the Odoacers. Is that how you say it? I'm not even sure how you say it. <laughs> At any rate, three rulers of Germanic tribes took over Rome. Yeah, okay, the first one was 410. I'm sorry. Rome was sacked by Alaric, king of Vis Visigoths. In AD 455, it was sacked again by the Vandals. And then the last one was 476. So 410, 476... Add those two together, divide it by two, you get around 440 AD. That's when Pope Sixtus III was there. The Pope was given power by these three Germanic leaders. All three of them gave the power to the Pope to control Rome. Again, as it says in Daniel here, he spoke arrogantly. And he's the one who was given power. This was the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. The fall of the Roman Empire was at the exact time that the end would come, the 6,000 year sat, uh, time. So what ended up happening is the correct timeline is that 6,000, year 6,000 was at the fall of the Roman Empire. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, by the way, what I'm looking at right now. No one really knows about this original timeline. If you look at the original timeline, here you have one of my favorite teachers, Deolophius of Antioch, telling you the time frame in his days. All the years from creation of the world amount to a total of 5,698 years, odd months and days. Deolophius of Antioch, AD 169. Subtract 169 from 5698, you get about 5,530. This was around the time that the King of Kings was born. It predicts this in a numerous text. I've shown it before. I can show it right now if I can find the document. Where are you at? Come on, where are you at? Is it this one? Yeah, here we go. So you can see it predicted here in the book of Adam. 5,000 and a half thousandth year, he will come. The sun will come upon the earth. You have here another one, second Adam and Eve. At the end of great day, five days and a half, concerning which I've made the promise to thee and thy father, I will send my word. You have here, first Adam and Eve, only when 5,500 years are fulfilled. At that time, I'll give you the fruit of the tree of life. And you have another one down here that tells you the same thing also, 5,500 years. This one is Nicodemus. And then you got another one that says what happens at the year 6,000. That's when Elijah and Enoch, the two olive trees, come, which is at the fall of the Roman Empire. 5,500 was 0 AD. At 500 years, you get 500 AD. That's approximately the time frame of the fall of the Roman Empire. These olive trees must have been there at that time frame, at the time frame of Pope Sixtus III. And what's interesting about that is Pope Sixtus III was friends with St. Augustine, Everyone knows who everyone knows who St. Augustine is, pretty much. But no one knows who Pope Sixtus III is. St. Augustine is the father of teaching for both the Protestant and Catholic Church. That's kind of interesting, considering he was friends with Pope Sixtus III. He was around 400 AD with St. Augustine. Actually, let me look at the exact time frame of St. Augustine. Let's go look at that real quick. Uh, St. Augustine, and I'll show you how he was friends with him. But he was friends with a young he was friends with the young Pope Sixtus III before he became Pope. Uh, Hippo. Apparently he wants to talk about everything else. Okay. Augustine of Hippo. What were you? 354 to 430. 75 years old. So 430 AD. So he lived almost to the time of the end. Fall of the Roman Empire. Again, Pope Sixtus III became Pope around 430 whatever to 440 or 440. He was like 440 AD or something he was. He was friends with him before that, before he was Pope. 
St. Jerome and St. Augustine both try to convince everybody that there is no millennial, of course, kingdom coming. This was what they were spending their time doing. St. Jerome was the one who wrote the Latin Vulgate. He said that women were the root of, you know, of all evil, which is a ridiculous statement, but that's what he said. I think he was the one who said that. I'm pretty sure he was the one that said that. I think I'm right. I'm pretty sure I'm right. I have, I have, I have, I know, I know it's one of those fathers that said that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was him though. Um, he thought that way. I can tell you that whether or not he said it, he thought that way. I can guarantee you that much. Um, but uh, yeah, so the medieval times, the thousand years called the medieval times was exactly the millennial, of course, kingdom. This was the time frame that they were trying to convince everyone, everyone, like all the believers thought this is what it was. That the medieval times that were coming forward, coming soon, were the millennial, of course, kingdom. And St. Jerome and Augustine spent their time trying to convince everybody otherwise that it's not the case. And I can show you that. Okay, where is it at? Yeah, here we go. Here it is. At the beginning of the 5th century, 5,900 a.m. This is the actual original timeline, by the way. 5,900 a.m., 100 years before the end. Jerome and Augustine, perceiving the danger of apocalyptic millennialism, or believing there's a thousand years coming soon, which actually did happen in the medieval times, developed a new and more stringent ways to oppose it. Jerome introduced a new set of calculations, AM2, that placed the incarnation roughly 300 years earlier, thus allowing Latin chronographers to ignore the advent of 6,000 AM1. So Jerome purposely lied about when the King of Kings was born. He literally changed the numbers 300 years. It says in Daniel, he shall speak great words against the high one. It shall, and it sh he shall think to himself able to change times and laws. Where is this coming from? Jerome following a very false spirit changing times and laws. He doesn't want anybody to know. And isn't it interesting? No one knows today. No one knows this stuff. I'm telling you right now. When was the Vatican Library created? 1475. Oh, that's interesting. That's exactly after the medieval times. Almost like they want to put history in a little library and no one can read it. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, kind of little, a little bit weird. Joan of Arc, I had a dream about all this. I had a dream about Joan of Arc, and I didn't know it was her. I, I had a dream, and there was a number of little markers in my dream, and I, I looked up all the stuff, and I ended up figuring out who it was about. It's about Joan of Arc and, and about her friend, Gilius. Was when is essentially the time frame when Lucifer got out of the bottomless, of course, pit. So he was in it during the millennial, during the medieval times. He was in the pit. And this is why they weren't successful, the devils, during that time frame during that thousand years is because their leader was in a pit and couldn't tell him what to do because he knew more mysteries than they did. How did he know more mysteries? Because he used to be sort of like the top dude that knew all the mysteries next. He, he was, he was one of the highest angels. So he knew a lot of the mysteries, which of course the other ones didn't know. So when he's in the pit, they weren't able to essentially do much during a thousand years. Of course, another religion was created around that exact time frame. I think you can guess which one that is. Exactly at the fall of the Roman Empire, a religion was created. Exactly at the time. At any rate, I'll let you guess on what it might be. But the fact is, we had uh, Joan of Arc, and she was being used by Gilius as a pawn. And that's another thing that I'm going to be discussing over on my website, GR Videos is how this is how the devil started coming back into power and what he did. He used someone innocent, Joan of Arc, to bring about something. Okay? And again, like I said, Lucifer knew more mysteries than any of the other angels because he was essentially the the announcer, the top top level dog, I guess you would say, uh, under God. Um, and of course he fell but he still had the mysteries, but of course he's lost a lot. 
because he fell, he lost a lot of his powers. He's lost probably a lot of his knowledge even. He still remembers some of it, obviously. But, you know, as you get more and more corrupt, you become more and more this as time goes on. And so he's trying to hold it together right now and trying to bring about his last hoorah, which I don't think is going to work out too well for him. But anyway, I'm going to get into all that uh, on, my, on my website, GR Videos. I'm going to get into what's going on with Joan of Arc and Gilead because it's a little complicated, but it, it shows you how, how the devil works and how he's trying to bring about stuff today even. I kind of want some of you guys to think. Let me know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.